Good afternoon. My name is Leanne Hamby and I am the marketing manager for Herald Press and welcome to Common Read. Uh, this, uh, this month, for the month of January, the, com the Common Read is I Am Not Your Enemy, Stories to Transform a Divided World by Michael McRae. And we are having a wonderful discussion today with Michael McRae. So let me introduce you to Michael. Michael, welcome Hello. to Common Read. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to get to be here. It's great to have you. It's great to have you. You know, when 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 you write a book like this, you never really know what's going to be happening in the world when it hits. Yeah. <laughs> and certainly when we scheduled this for the common read, we had no idea what was going to be happening in the world <laughs> when yeah. we were having this discussion. Yeah. So it's sad to say this always pertinent but it just seems to be extraordinarily per pertinent right now. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, it's, you, sometimes you really want your book to be topical and other times you don't. And in this case, I would really like my book to not feel so topical. Um, so, cause it means there's something very wrong. Right. Uh, well, I mean, you have been involved with peacemaking uh, for a long time. You look over your resume and you, internships and, and studies and uh, degrees and places that you've that you've been and people you've worked under. Yeah. So tell us why um, peacemaking and peace building is important to you. I really think the, the roots of it are actually in uh, my Christian upbringing. Um, and so I grew up in a very small town uh, in Tennessee where my father was a family practice physician and um, he, my family chose to be there because my dad felt that part of his work as a family practice physician was to, uh, was to be a doctor for people living in poverty. Um, and that's something that he felt convicted of because of his understanding of the gospel. And so when we, when I was growing up, my siblings and I, we, my dad talked to us a lot about Matthew 25, um, as a cheat sheet for the final exam, he would call it. So in case those listening don't know the reference, Matthew 25 is that there's, there's a, a section in that chapter where Jesus is speaking to the disciples and says, um, uh, you know, he's basically telling this story about the end, the judgment day, you'll be divided between the left and the right. And, and I'll say to you, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you, and you took care of me. And they'll say, when did, when did we do that? And he said, well, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. And so dad said, this is essentially a cheat sheet for the final exam that Jesus is sort of telling us what we're gonna be asked on the final exam on judgment day. And it actually didn't have anything to do with what we believed about Jesus or God, who we said that God was. It had to do with where we spent our time and who we spent our time with. And so that framing of, of paying attention to, um, to where I'm spending my time and, and knowing that Jesus, is, that Jesus is alive today and the experiences of the, of the marginalized and the least of these was really formative. And so as I, um, as I began kind of latching on to storytelling as a way of, of engaging the world, and that would be another longer story, but uh, I, I started focusing on the stories of people whose stories aren't being told, the stories of people who are living on the underside of, uh, of the world in a way. And that often then meant that I was, I was finding myself in places of conflict and places of violence where stories were being snuffed out. Um, and so my first ever international trip was to Israel when I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, and I fell in love with that place. And in falling in love with the place, I fell in love with the people. And as I grew up traveling there, I've now made 13 trips to Israel and Palestine. I ended up learning much more of the deep, the dynamics of the conflict and the, the injustices that are happening there. And I found myself really wanting to be part of healing that place and, and dealing with the conflict in some way. And so decided, I think I want to engage peacemaking and peace building as one of my contributions to my life on earth. Uh, and so um, ended up pursuing study masters in conflict resolution in Belfast and, and found really that the intersection of peace building and storytelling was where I felt the most alive. Wow. Well, you tell a lot of great stories in here. Now, I know this was part of an educational project at first. Yeah. So you interviewed a lot more people than what appeared in the book. That's right. Yeah, I was partnering with TCU, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, and uh, I interviewed about 60 or so, 60, 70 people um, in Israel, Palestine, Northern Ireland, and South Africa. Um, 
but there are only 10 chapters in the book and most each chapter usually tells around one person's story so most of the stories didn't make it um yeah it's that's one of the hardest parts about these kinds of projects is the editing down uh even when i transcribed some of the conversations i had they might be forty thousand words but the chapter had to be five thousand words so you're still just cutting so much stuff and it's a, it's really hard decisions to make about what do i think is the real essence of the story that we that i want to get across so right yeah. and i mean you talk to some people who have really i mean just seen the most horrific things that any of us could imagine so you know um haven't seen your or knowing your father was blown up in a hotel in Belfast. Um, her story was so powerful. You, but yeah. She wanted to meet the IRA bomber who was responsible for killing her dad. Um, right, yeah. And uh, people in South Africa who just been not really enslaved anymore, but basically for all intents and purposes, still living, living a life of, of enslavement and, and not free, not freedom and, yeah. and what that means in their life and uh, different Palestinians and Israelis and, the, and uh, all the stuff that they've been through. And some of that, some of that we have in this country, not to, not to the same extent. Uh, that I mean, those are hotbeds of conflict known for centuries to be, but we are seeing things like that in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, to police shootings and riots and uh, this massive, massive political divisions that are just playing themselves out in our streets. And I know we talked a little bit about this, but what kind of threads do you think, like what can we pull from these kinds of stories to help us heal America right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my first, you know, my first answer is I don't know, right? Like this is such a, it's such a, um, the task is so monumental of what we're dealing with in the in the U.S. and it's it's monumental everywhere. I mean, these conflicts, in, you know, in Northern Ireland, Israel, Palestine, South Africa, they went on for decades and decades. Um, and it's not like when the conflict started is when the conflict started, so to speak. Like it's not that the institution of apartheid in South Africa in 1948 was the beginning of the problem, right? It had been going on for a long time. And the same thing is true here. These problems go back to the, the founding of America and the way in which it was done, the enslavement of Africans and others and um, you know, Jim Crow convict leasing, lynchings, all these things that mass incarceration, all these things that have still been going on. And that's just in terms of, of dynamics of race. These, these, yeah, this is not something that's going to be solved anytime soon. And it's not, it's not even something that it's, you know, even talking about healing is complicated because the wound, the wound is, is not even just like it's scarring over now, like it's actively bleeding everywhere, right? You know, that the, the wounds are, are actually even being made worse over in, in, in some ways. And so it's like, um, I was actually watching Colbert the other day and he said, you know, there's a great, there's all these calls for unity at the moment. And, uh, and he said, but shouldn't there be a price for admission for unity, which I thought was a really interesting idea. Like what is required of us to actually pursue unity and healing? What is, what are the acknowledgements, the responsibility that we have to take? And in the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, for instance, um, they gave the perpetuators of apartheid and those who resisted apartheid the chance to have amnesty to not have to go to prison. But one of the requirements was that they had to make a full public confession and they had to tell the truth. And I know that we just lost Leanne. So I'll just, I'll just keep chatting until we get Leanne back. Um, that we, they had to be able to tell the truth. Uh, and, and if they made a full public confession uh, and it was deemed that they were not lying, they could be given amnesty. And I think part of what that says is that we don't get to just lie. <laughs> and then say well now's the time for unity without having to say there's some truth that needs to be told and i think the telling of the truth is one of the most important um, dynamics uh, that we we have to deal with when we're talking about building peace um, and so in terms of the thread that i think can run through um, that we can kind of pull out from these stories that there is this um, I, I saw in the stories this kind of principle of dismantling the notion of the enemy, that we, we create these ideas of who enemies are, um, and that 
that language of enemy, the ide ideology of enemy perpetuates so much violence. And that the way that, that the people that I met in these, in these countries were dealing with that seemed to come through three different ways. The first was the idea of proximity, that we have to actually get closer to the people or the ideas that we're afraid of, that, we're, that we've condemned, that we're judging. Um, but that getting closer isn't going to solve the problem. And I think that's one of the things that I hear often. It's like, if we could just sit down together or, you know, we just need to meet one another, but that's not sufficient. We know that that's not sufficient. You can just look at places like prison where prison guards and prisoners live in really close proximity, but there's not necessarily a whole lot of harmony happening or any other place of conflict where people are fighting. There's proximity there, uh, but it's about what is the quality of the proximity? And so I think second to that, once we get close enough, uh, to hear one another, we actually have to have this, the practice of humility. And I think of, of um, Snoopy here, there's a Snoopy comic where Snoopy is sitting on his dog house when Charlie Brown approaches him. And Charlie Brown says, I hear you are writing a book of theology. I hope you have a good title. And Snoopy says, I have the best title. And his title for his book of theology is, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? Which is a really important question to be asking ourselves. Has it ever occurred to us that we might be wrong? And then hopefully then from this question of humility comes curiosity, which is the third thing that there's actually, we have to cultivate a desire to want to know more. We can't just think, oh, I might be wrong. Uh, we, we then have to say, so what do I need to learn to challenge my own assumptions about this person or these ideas or this place? And so those three things, proximity, humility, and curiosity um, were really consistent, I think, through the, uh, through the stories, as well as this practice of empathy then uh, that the, the, intentional um, work of trying to imagine that, um, that there is more truth in the world than your own understanding of it, that there are other ways of living life, other ways of finding meaning, other ways of, uh, of understanding the world. And that this, um, when in the case of Joe Barry, who Leanne was mentioning, whose father was killed by an IRA bomber, um, this is what was transformative for her and for uh, Pat McGee, uh, the, the bomber that she met, um, that they both were able to empathize with each other, where she was able to say, I can imagine that if I had grown up in Belfast in the time that Pat grew up um, with all the things that he experienced, that I might have found myself um, committing a similar kind of bombing. And that, that can be a really transformative realization. And so I think empathy, proximity, humility, curiosity, these things were really important. But it also, as I said, this practice of telling the truth um, and facing the world for what it is and trying to, to be honest in our diagnosis of what's happening. Um, you know, one of the most powerful stories in the book for me comes from uh, an Israeli soldier. He was an Israeli soldier, he's not anymore. His name's Moran Zamir. And he, uh, he tells about kind of, this sense of patriotism that he had going into the Israeli army and all the things that he um, that he felt like he was doing and defending his country and but then what he was asked to do in Gaza so um, troubled him and some of the actions of his fellow soldiers um, that he left very disillusioned and he began to examine what was happening and he the, the phrase he used was that he realized that something was wounded in his country that needed to be tended to uh, and he didn't want to just leave that to the politicians. He felt like something was required of him and required of everyone. And I think this is a great, um, uh, an important question for us all to be asking ourselves is what is it that is wounded in our country that needs for us, needs uh, to be tended to? Um, and we can't, you know, as an individual, I can't attend to everything, right? That's just not practical. Um, I don't have the skills to do that, but it's asking what can I attend to? Um, what, where does my um, where do my gifts and my skills and my services, my abilities intersect with a great need of the world? Um, and then to try to find a way to, uh, to operate at that, uh, at that intersection. So I think those were, um, those were really important threads that came from it. Um, and then Alyssa, do you want me to just keep talking or do you have, I don't know if we've got Leanne back? Um, he is working on it, but I actually, I have another question for you, um, and maybe in a more granular sense. Um, so when we, when we look at conflict in general, but thinking on a, on a day-to-day -day basis for individuals, what our lives look like right now, what do you yeah. think are some things that are, are important for us to bear in mind, um, 
with the way that we're interacting with conflict on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm thinking specifically in terms of on the internet, since most of us are stuck in our houses right now, that's where most of our social interaction is coming from. Um, and just, I guess, what are, what are some things that you think would be key insights into how conflict plays out in that space? Yeah, well, I mean, in my mind, conflicts that happen on the internet, I guess, in terms of social media are not worth engaging in. Um, you know, I think we all have to make decisions on how we spend our time and what is worth the emotional investment. Um, and no one's mind has ever been changed by a comment on their on a Facebook post, right? It just doesn't it doesn't happen. Um, and so, because uh, really, what we end up doing is we just end up arguing our positions back and forth. Um, and uh, and I think that the one of my friends, uh, uh, Shane Claiborne, says we don't argue, we can't argue people into new ways of thinking. We story them into new ways of thinking. Now, obviously, that's it's an it's a, a kind of a, a principle. Of course, there are times when you can be convinced by a really good argument. But in general, when we start debating people, we don't actually make much progress. It usually just actually it fuels the conflict. What helps is when we can get down to the level of story. So one of the ways that I learned about this in, in my master's program is something that's called the pen diagram. So it's a pyramid uh, and it's P-I-N. So the top level of the pyramid, the smallest little layer, uh, are, is the P, which are positions. Then the next layer, the middle layer, are interests, that's the I. And then the bottom largest layer are needs, that's the N. And the idea is, is that most of the time when we get into conflict, like debating with people on the internet, we end up sticking up here at the P level, the positions. You know, I believe this, well, you're wrong because I believe this. And, you know, and we just go back and forth. No one's mind is changed by that. In fact, it, the research shows that it actually just further cements you in your belief in your own rightness when you get into those debates. But where there's actually possibility for some kind of change is when we get down to the level of needs. What are the needs that this individual has that's giving rise to their positions? Uh, another friend of mine named Padre Gotuma says, most people do what seems reasonable to them at the time, most of the time. Most people do what seems reasonable to them at the time, most of the time. And so a helpful question is, what would I need, how would I need to see the world for what for this position to be reasonable. Now, it may be that I, of course, am going to absolutely disagree with that position, but if I'm trying to um, resolve a conflict, to de-escalate, to empathize, to transform the conflict, to reconcile, whatever it might be, then this practice is a really helpful one. How could I see this from their point of view in a way that would make it seem that within that, that frame of seeing the world, it could seem like a reasonable thing? What need is this meeting? Um, so as an example, one, some of the work that I do is with an organization called Narrative Four, uh, which is an organization that is using the, the power of uh, story exchanges to build empathy and create connection um, and shatter stereotypes. And the way a story exchange works is that you get a group of people together, pair them off so that they're in groups of, of two, telling each other a true story from their life based on a theme or a prompt. They listen very deeply to one another. And then you bring everyone back into the circle so that we're all sitting together and each person then retells their partner's story in first person language as if their partner's story happened to them. So Alyssa, if you and I were, were paired, uh, then when we get back into the circle, I would say, hi, my name is Alyssa and I work for Herald Press, you know, and I would do this whole, uh, and I would tell your story as if it were mine. So we did a story exchange several years ago on gun violence where we brought people together kind of on opposite sides of the gun debate, so to speak. And so two of the people that ended up being paired together were someone named Todd and someone named Caroline. Todd owns about 250 guns and actually his website orchestrated the sale of George Zimmerman's gun that killed Trayvon Martin. His partner was Caroline who held her daughter in her arms uh, as she bled out from um, uh, a shooting. I believe it was in a mall in Utah. Um, so they're on very different sides of the debate on guns. Todd was not interested in seeing restrictions on guns. Caroline's marching in Washington, you know, for um, uh, for more gun control. They were paired together, had to listen to one another's stories, and then articulate those in first-person language. Uh, and it was remarkable to see what happened it, when Todd was retelling the story of uh, Hey, Leanne. When Todd was retelling the story of um, uh, of Lee, of um, Caroline's daughter dying, he just began weeping. 
Um, and it was this really moving uh, uh, experience for him. And part of what they saw was that their positions were totally different, right? Todd believed that uh, there should be no restrictions on guns. Caroline believed that there should. In a sense, those are irreconcilable positions. But when they got down to the level of needs and story, what Caroline learned was that Todd believed that. Todd had that position because when he was a child, he was abused by his father severely. And when he finally grabbed a gun and pointed it at his father, the abuse stopped. You know, they, they, Todd's lesson was guns keep me safe. And so he wanted as many guns as he could to keep himself safe. Caroline is marching to try to have more gun control because guns took her daughter from her. So less guns will keep her safe. Uh, and so when you get to that level of what is it, what is the need that's giving rise to this position? You see that the need is in fact the same. The need is for security and safety. Now it's manifesting in completely different positions, mm -hmm. um, but we can have a very different conversation here at the level of needs and how can we meet each other's needs than if we're just saying, well, I believe the second amendment is bogus. Well, I believe it's important. Like that's not gonna get us anywhere. Um, so I think that's been a very helpful tip for me, just even in my own marriage, you know, when we, when I get into fights or conflicts with my wife to be asking myself, okay, what is the need that's giving rise here? What, you know, how is this, how would I articulate her position in a way that would feel reasonable to her? Um, and those are really helpful practices, I think, in dealing with conflict in my daily life. That reminds me so much. I don't know if you already talked about it, but the story of Rami and Bassam. I have not talked about it, no. Okay, well, I, you, you mentioned in the book that they were both fighting for basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, so yeah, Rami and Bassam, this is the last chapter in the book. Some of you may have read their stories. Um, Colin McCann wrote a, a New York Times bestselling novel this year called The Paragon, uh, which is now gonna be made into a movie by Steven Spielberg. And it's about the stories of these two men um, so Rami El Hanan is an Israeli father who, um, whose father was able to survive Auschwitz, but his daughter didn't survive her 14th birthday. She, uh, her name was Smadar, and she was um, killed by a Palestinian suicide bomber uh, in Jerusalem. And then Bassam Aramin is a Palestinian uh, father who spent time in Israeli prison for resistance to the occupation. Um, who uh, and whose daughter Abir was 10 when she was coming home from school in the West Bank and was shot in the back of the head by an Israeli soldier um, and uh, with a fire with a rubber bullet, but it, it killed her. Um, and so uh, these two men in the kind of language of conflict have every reason to hate each other. Um, you know, that they are, uh, they're on opposite sides of this and they're both bereaved, but they, it is that shared experience of bereavement uh, and the need to prevent other people from experiencing this same sense of loss uh, that has actually given rise to a very deep friendship between them and this ongoing work. And so they have been part of um, what's called the Parent Circle, which is an organization of bereaved Israeli and Palestinian families who are using this kind of the weapon of their grief to fight for uh, a shared future um, without violence, um, believing that, you know, that they they have paid the highest price possible in conflict. It's always the highest price, losing the people that you love. Um, and if anyone has the right to keep the conflict going, it's them. Um, and yet they're saying it's precisely because of what we've lost that we are so committed uh, to a future without violence um, because that's what it's gonna take. Um, and so Rami and Bassam um, uh, have, they were the leaders of the parent circle until just recently. Um, and now they're, they're uh, expanding their work into other areas, but they're, uh, it's an amazing example of, uh, of what Rami said to me, where he said, um, we come up against this tall wall of hatred and animosity that divides our two peoples, and we will ram our heads against it until we put cracks in it, uh, cracks of hope. And that's what I called the chapter was cracks of hope, because I think you know, in, a, in a way that's, that is what the work of peace building is, is that we keep ramming our heads against the walls that are erected around us of walls of animosity, walls of fear, walls of segregation, um, walls of, uh, of despair, um, walls of bad policy. Uh, and we keep ramming our heads against it until we can see cracks of hope forming. Um, and then we follow those cracks until we can dismantle those walls. Uh, and so there's, their story is one that, uh, that I have found um, really encouraging. That's why I ended the book with it. So I know we lost Leanne again. Uh, clearly she's having some internet issues. Uh, so um, I'm happy to look off the list, Alyssa, of questions that she was going to ask and just start responding to some, but if you have others, then that's fine too. 
I love this idea of cracks of hope. And I'm curious um, if you see any of those or what those might be in in the the current current um uh, as an american i'm thinking the american landscape but just generally i mean you're yeah. you're really well versed in conflicts around the world and so what what some examples of those might be um and what advice you might have about um how we can get ourselves in the mindset to to look for those yeah um that's a great question. I mean, I've honestly, you know, if I'm if I'm showing up here with a lot of authenticity, I have not been feeling very hopeful uh, in the last week, especially after um, there was an attempted uh, overthrow, essentially, of the U.S. government. Um, that has that's been weighing pretty heavily on me. Knowing what's coming, um, knowing that there is great violence that is coming, I feel very confident about that. Um, and so I do, I feel quite a bit of fear actually around what's, what's heading our way. And so it's been hard to find, to find the hope. Um, but I think the resiliency of people is, is really hopeful. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, so for instance, just the fact that, um, uh, that Congress came back and met at 3 AM to certify the election, like that's a crack of hope to say, we're not going to be deterred by the this violence you know there's still business to be done and we're going to keep going with the business of the country i think that's that's an encouraging thing um but i think um yeah i mean the, the cracks of hope that i see really are the stories of the kinds of people that i that i met to to, to know that there are that there are people in the world who have lost um the, the thing that we all fear the most to lose, whether that's our freedom, whether that's our um, our loved ones, um, and and that that it what they show is that it is not guaranteed that violence must be met with violence. It is not written anywhere that when you lose uh, the thing that you have feared the most to lose, that you must then get even. Like these things are not guaranteed. That there are other ways to uh, to live, and so I see people doing really um, really great work. Uh, and, and I've seen lots of posts kind of about this through on social media and other places to say, look, yes, the, the country seems to be deteriorating and also the work continues. You know, we let's not let's not act as if, um, you know, suddenly there is that everything has changed for us. In some ways, things are changing in other ways that the deep kind of long work of social justice and, and peace building um, is, is still there. It remains true. The commitment to the principles that we have of, uh, of justice and equity, of liberation, of nonviolence, of diversity, these things that make for peace are still, is still work that we have to do. And in, a, and in a way, I think the most important work of peace building, and maybe just the most basic work of peace building, is attending to people's capacity to meet their, their needs, to heal from the harm that they experience, and to thrive. Um, when I look at conflicts around the world, when I talk to people who have been living on the underside of those conflicts, not in the positions of power, it is almost always um, that that uh, that conflict uh, really emerges and violence emerges when people's um, basic living conditions uh, are unacceptable. You know, when they are unable to meet their basic needs. Even when you look at something like suicide terrorism, there was a study done of, of all suicide bombings from 1980 to 2007. Uh, it's a book called Cutting the Fuse. And 97%, I believe it was, of all cases of, uh, of suicide terrorism attacks um, were perpetuated by people who understood their homeland to be occupied by someone else's military, that there was a, a lack of freedom, a lack of control, that their daily, or, uh, that their daily uh, living conditions were under threat, that that's the kind of thing that gives rise to violence. Um, and so I think if we're talking about wanting to build peace, it isn't just around being nonviolent. It isn't just around talking about dialogue or um, uh, or unity or harmony. It is the, one of the best ways to reduce the risks of violence and to promote positive peace, which negative, there's language in conflict resolution, negative peace is the idea of basically just not having violence, so we're not killing each other. Uh, positive peace is the, uh, the absence of violence 
but also with the presence of justice and and equity and those things that make it more possible to not, to not be violent. And so when we attend to people's capacity to meet those needs, when people feel like I actually have the ability to, to take care of the needs that I have, to heal from the harms that I have, um, and to do that in a way that doesn't harm other people, then violence is, is unlikely to happen. Violence is usually the response of people who don't feel like they have nonviolent ways to meet their needs. Um, and, um, and you can even see that, I think, with, um, uh, with what's happening in the, in the United States right now. Um, even though I don't agree with it at all, and I think this perspective is based in a lie, the people that stormed the Capitol had a belief that the United States had stolen the election from Donald Trump, which was a lie. We know that that's not true, but that's what they believed. And so their need was to rectify this. And there were multiple way attempts beforehand through lawsuits, through other things, through recounts. And those were essentially nonviolent in a way to try to meet that need. And it didn't work. They still didn't get it. And so then their la the last resort was, well, then overthrow the, the capital. Um, and so I think it's just an example to say that there, for most people, when we have ways that don't require violence, that can actually help us get what it is that we're needing to live and, and to have fulfilled and thriving lives, um, then violence isn't as necessary. Um, and yet, you know, there is there are these calls now for um, for unity, you know, and for I was seeing this from from a lot of um, uh, from uh, Congress people, for instance, before the impeachment vote to say this is a time for unity. But I do think there has to be this question of, you know, what is going to be required of us before we can um, we can talk about uh, about unity, um, that compromise is, in fact, a virtue of peace. You know, it's it's unlikely that we're going to live well together with people um, who think differently if we're unable to compromise. And yet we also have to recognize that there are some things that you can't compromise on. You know, James Baldwin said that um, we, can, um, we, can, uh, we can disagree and still love each other unless our disagreement uh, is based in my oppression. Um, and I think that's really important to say um, where are the appropriate places for compromise and where are the places where to compromise is to be complicit in violence. Um, and, uh, and, and that the, I think the truth is that there are some things that are not reconcilable. Um, you know, some, some conflicts cannot be reconciled, which is why divorce exists, for instance. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes divorce is in fact what's needed. Sometimes ending a relationship is the, is the best approach. But the complication is, what does that mean as a country? You know, um, how does that work on these on these kinds of, of conflicts, um, where you know dissolving the United States, you know, um, uh, splitting it does not seem like a practical solution. Where we're going to have to recognize we're going to we're going to live together for better or worse. We're all still going to be here when whatever is happening now is done. Um, and so, how are we going to how are we going to find a way um, to live together that doesn't lead to um, armed militias deciding to march against one another because uh, we know how that project ends. Um, you know, we don't seem to be able to learn from history. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm beginning to take away is that we, we keep trying to tell, you know, like, let's look to other places in the world. That's what I was hoping we could do here. Let's look to other stories in the world as a way of helping us realize the lessons that we need to avoid these things. Uh, but I'm more and more, I'm wondering, I don't know if that works. I don't know that that we're able to really learn from other places. I think just like children don't often think, Ooh, I, you know, I want to do this, but my parents told me that was a bad idea from their own experience. I guess I won't do it. Generally, kids have to do it anyway, right? They learn from their own, you learn from the mistakes that you make. And I think that may be true culturally as well, that we, we, we learn from our own mistakes. And so we're going to end up entering this project of, of, um, uh, of insurrection, of possible civil war, of violence. Um, but we do know how it's going to end. It's going to end with nobody getting what they want and with a lot of people being dead and a lot of bereavement and a lot of grief and trauma. Um, and then figuring out how do we how do we heal from that. And so I wish that we were able to know that this is how these projects end and we could skip those projects altogether. Um, and yet uh, I'm not always I'm not always sure that that you know that that can happen. And so it is difficult, I think, at times to figure out where do we where do we find the hope. But I I, I do think that the stories here are are hopeful to me, and knowing that even when this violence like what is coming um, uh, happens, uh, it doesn't have to be the end of the story. You know, we do get to keep writing new chapters. 
That's really valuable insight. And I'm, I'm intrigued by a couple of things that you just mentioned, one being the, the way that you phrased, um, you know, conflict usually arises when someone's understanding of the situation is that they are oppressed. And, you know, depending on who you ask in different situations, you're going to get different answers about who the oppressed party is. And when we have that level of subjectivity in a situation, I'm wondering, I think this is where the, the story piece comes in that you're talking about in that we need to be able to, to share and understand one another's stories. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what happens with that, that rub though, when, when we have situations where, um, uh, it, it, to me, it feels like often we're, we're more than willing to jump to the severing of the relationship. Like I've, I've seen that, that Baldwin quote or Baldwin quote cited so many places. Uh, and, and I, agree with it and empathize with it, but I also wonder if that is the approach that we take to these situations, like you said, where like, okay, if we're not going to learn to live together, what do we do then? Um, what is the solution here? Um, I don't see progress. I don't see a, a, a route to improvement of the situation if the answer is always ending of the relationship, ending of the discussion, um, and not to say that the oppressed party is the person who needs to be having those conversations, um, but I'm wondering what maybe you would say, what you would speak into that context of uh, just so many people saying there's no reasoning with this idea and so I'm not going to engage with it, but when yeah. nearly 50% of the country holds one idea and 50% of the country holds another um, idea that the which then those two being in direct conflict if everyone's saying I can't engage because you're so wrong where do we even go from there and and I understand what right. you're saying and I think I agree that um, sometimes we have to experience a, a like I like your language of project we have to take on these projects um, and and carry them out to their inevitable end before we can learn. But I'm wondering what another route would even look like in that, in that situation when um, the, the, I would say the easiest way would be to say, I'm not going to engage with a, a person whose ideas are um, diametrically opposed to mine because I can't even get to a point where we could have a conversation what does that getting yeah. to that point look like like how do we even approach a, a conversation or a relationship um where that that has devolved to that degree i suppose yeah i'm reminded of the <clears throat> uh after george floyd was was murdered and uh back in may i believe it was um uh, and um, the you know people took to the streets uh, very appropriately in my mind. Um, I I saw a lot of posts about kind of um, uh, the importance of of, of um, like purging your social media feed of all the toxic voices, all the people that were perpetuating harm. You know, just unfriend people. It's easy. Just click a button. Um, and on the one hand, I understand that idea of being like, sometimes engaging in this is just absolutely eating away at my soul and I can't do it anymore. But I also, I posted something to just say, you know, kind of with respect to my fellow white folks, I kind of not sure that this is the right, the, the right step to, um, because it's not like the, the, the people that we're unfriending are magically disappearing from the world. Um, they still exist and someone's gonna hear them. And shouldn't it kind of be part of our responsibility as white people to say that's that's kind of our work? We we need to engage with that. And um, uh, one of the people I talk about in the book, uh, Ali Abu Awad, who's the I tell his story in the first chapter. I'm actually getting to work with him now on a project of um, uh, a Palestinian nonviolence national nonviolence charter. So I'm get, I was actually just on a call with him today. So it's exciting to get to continue to work with him. And um, one of the things that he that he talks about is 
um, that the kind of the, 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 if you don't have a lot of context for Israel, Palestine, there's a thing called settlements. There's, you know, Israel and there's the West Bank and inside the West Bank are Israeli cities that are being built illegally on Palestinian land. They're called settlements. Um, major problem in trying to deal with the, with any kind of peace accord in Israel and Palestine. And so <clears throat> Ali is saying that there are a lot of kind of people in the Israeli peace camp, the kind of the leftists in Israel, um, who as a matter of principle say, we will not engage with settlers because we're not gonna normalize that. So we won't drive on settler roads. We won't even go to the West Bank. We will not have conversations with settlers because we're not gonna in any way, um, uh, because dialogue with a settler would be a way of, of normalizing their behavior. And Ali's point was, but what that means is that it's then on me as the Palestinian to have to talk to the settlers because they're not going anywhere. I'm surrounded by them. So suddenly now but you've abdicated responsibility to deal with your own people and now it's on me. Um, and so I do think that it's, it is, um, there's a balance between saying at a certain point, there are some minds that can't be changed. I do think, I mean, um, uh, opening a mind is a uh, is an inside job, <laughs> in a way. Like there has to there has to be some kernel of of uh, curiosity in a person's mind that maybe there's another way to think. And if, without that, it, it's, there's not a whole lot of chance that we're gonna that anyone's mind's gonna change. Um, and so there there are limits. I do think there are limits to what what we can, how far we can take conversations. But I also think we have such an aversion to conflict um, that the moment that we're just like, oh wait, you don't agree with me, I'm done. Uh, never mind. And I can even see that, like within the, like you know, for instance, people on the left who uh, who were voting for Bernie or for Elizabeth Warren and would just be like at each other's throats. And I'm like, you agree on 98% of all things, but 2%, and now we're toxic to one another and we have to cancel each other. That kind of a culture to me is getting us nowhere. Um, and at the same time, recognizing, you know, we, um, uh, not every ideology can be reasoned with. Um, and I think one of the major complications that I think we're in in the United States now is that we are in a, an absolute crisis of truth and information. Um, and that's something that I haven't seen in the same way in other conflicts, you know, in Israel and Palestine, Northern Ireland, South Africa, um, you know, there might be a belief that, you know, as white people in South Africa, we have the right to do what we want here. Um, and, you know, uh, and so there's like an, I would disagree with your perspective, but we like, we, we can see what's happening around us. And there are certain facts that we're probably gonna, we're gonna agree on, um, even if our, um, uh, our belief or in the rightness or wrongness of those facts is different. But in the US, there's this sense of, there's a whole group of people that like we are living in different realities, right? There is, there is a refusal to accept the evidence of our own eyes. Um, and, and that is the part that I'm like, this seems different. There's something that's changing here. The way in which there's now, you know, millions of people who believe that the news is fake like that's that's a problem um, because like so much of dealing with conflict is finding a way to talk about the story of what has happened um, in a way that we can both live with it and some kind of telling of the truth. But if telling the truth leads to people saying this is just fake and I just I will refuse to believe it no matter what you put in front of me, like then that's a different level of of conflict than uh, than I really have many examples of. Um, and so that's one of the things that I, that I feel is particularly concerning and can make it hard to know, how do I really engage with you? How do we make this relationship work if you're claiming that something is true that is demonstrably not true? And how are we going to, how are we going to do that? Um, and yet at the same time, as I say, um, there are some, some relationships where divorce is the way to go. And there are some where that's too quick of an option. Um, but I don't know practically what that would look like in the United States. We, we, we can't just, I mean, we, we fought a war 150 years ago about whether the, the country was going to stay together. And I hope that we're not about to do that again. Um, but I don't, I don't, we do have to, I think, ask ourselves to, to recognize just the truth of, of, of our circumstance, which is um, we, the country is very split. 
none of us are going anywhere. There's not going to be some mass exodus of people either who voted for Biden or voted for Trump. They're, we're not going anywhere. So we are going to keep living together. And the solution is clearly not that we just start shooting everyone who is different than us. That is not the solution. Um, and so then it just becomes asking the question. So what what is going to help us uh, live in a way that doesn't mean that we need to that we need to get guns. I've got friends on the left who um, who are part of Antifa, um, and and I also would consider myself an anti-fascist. I hope that we all do, um, but who are who believe that look, get a gun, and that's what my friends are telling me. Get a gun, have it because violence is coming. And I was just like, I don't. I'm not going to accept that. I don't want to operate in that um, uh, by that calculation to say that where we are now is that I need to get a gun to protect my family. Like I don't want to play by those rules. Um, and so, uh, and because that will then, if that is not an option, if I'm saying com picking up guns and going and fighting other people is not an option, well, then I am then forced through necessity to be more creative. <laughs> uh, and I think so often violence is the solution of people who've lost their imagination. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I don't have answers for it, which is why you can tell I'm sort of talking in circles. I don't have clear answers for it. And I think, uh, I think it is, it's a collective effort where we, um, we're just going to try things and we're going to keep trying things and, and sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. Um, but that what, what I keep coming back to is that the long-term work of peace building is attending to the needs that people have, the ability that people have to meet their own needs. That is, in my mind, our best chance um, of, uh, of, of minimizing violent conflict, not minimizing conflict. Conflict in itself is not a bad thing. The heat, um, like, you know, fires can both burn, but they can also warm and they can, they can provide um, the necessary heat to keep us alive. Uh, like there is, there's learning to be had in conflict. There's sharpening to be had. Um, conflict in, in, you know, when I have conflict with my wife, that can be a way of saying there's something that's not working here. And now there's an opportunity for us to make something even better. Conflict itself can be an opportunity. So most people who are in conflict resolution are not interested in avoiding conflict. We're interested in avoiding violent conflict. <laughs> we're interested in avoiding conflict that leads to people dying. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and to, to figure out how do we channel the energy of conflict into something uh, that can help us rather than, than cause us harm. That's a really valuable insight. Um, I, we have a little over 10 minutes left, so I'm going to invite attendees. If you have questions um, for Michael, uh, feel free to contribute them through the Q&A feature. Um, we'll, we'll aim to wrap up right around noon, and if, if we do have questions, we'll work to answer as many of those as possible. Um, <clears throat> Great. Uh, I don't, Michael, I'm not sure how much you've gotten to talk so far. Oh, we've got one. Let's see. Um, so we have a question that says, when both sides believe in Jesus or are folks of faith, what role does Jesus play in peace building work? Yeah, wow. Um, that's a great question. I, and I, you know, I, I, I certainly noticed that at the Capitol on the 6th, there were people holding Jesus saves um, uh, signs um, and uh, Trump flags that had a cross on it. And, you know, it is, it is remarkable to... Um, to see the different ways of understanding Jesus. I, when I started studying history, I did a history degree at Lipscomb University here in Nashville. And one of the best professors I've ever had, probably the best, a man named Richard Good, um, told me, um, he said that one of the most important questions in Christian life is the question of who is your Jesus? Um, and that has really stuck with me. How is it that I understand Jesus? Um, and, you know, and. and on the one hand, it would seem as if my hope is that the the shared um, the shared love of Jesus can be a and respect for the person can can be a, a source of common ground. And yet, it comes back to this issue that we we're just I was just talking about about living in different realities. Our Jesus is not the same, right? Like we are reading and and believing in very different interpretations of a person, um, and that. Um, uh, that there, there are some who's, who, for whom the important part about Jesus is the authority and kind of dominion uh, and power of Jesus. For others, it has more to do with the powerlessness of Jesus in the sense of the, the nonviolent way in which Jesus went to his death 
um, the, who Jesus spent his time with, like those are the things that are more, that are particularly interesting and important to me, the way that Jesus told stories, um, the values that he had. Um, and so I, I think to me, Jesus can play, Jesus for me has been such a, who I understand him to be and, and how he spent his time has been very forming for me and my commitment to work for, uh, for peace. And yet, uh, Jesus, the way, a way of interpreting Jesus has also been central and people believing that the, the right step here is to grab guns and go try to kill people in Congress. Like that those are both tied up in theology. Um, and so we, there's so many different crises, crises happening at the same time, crisis of, of uh, information, of truth, but also of theology, um, of storytelling, uh, and so um, I don't I don't know exactly how we how Jesus um, the kind of helps us in terms of our peacemaking, except to say that I my hope is that when when people really read the stories of Jesus, we can see that uh, there's you know the way that Jesus said, look, if my followers were from, were of this world, we would have picked up you know swords and gone to battle essentially. But that's that's not the way that we're going to do things. Um, that's been really forming for me to say to be part of the of the world that Jesus is interested in is to say you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play by the rules of, of violent conflict the rules of domination um, and yet there are people who think to believe in Jesus is to exactly play by those rules and so um, it, it there and part of I guess what, what I'm getting at here is that it reminds me that the work of peace building is so multifaceted there isn't it, it's not that then to be a peace builder is that you go stand on the front lines of, of war and that's the only way to be engaged. There, I think history teachers are one of the most important, uh, um, that's one of the most important roles in peace building. How are we teaching the stories of our past? Because you can see in the, some of the conflict that we're having in the United States, there are very different stories about the past. Uh, what was the Confederacy, for instance? Um, the rightness or wrongness of enslaving other people. There's disagreement about that, right? So the way that we tell the story is important. The, the work of trauma healing, the work of education and teaching principles of peace, um, the, the work of violence de-escalation, the work of governance and policies of justice, and also the work of theology. Like this can be a practice of peace building. And I, uh, on one hand, that can feel very overwhelming to see, oh my gosh, there are so many different facets here. But I think we have a way of letting that complexity be our friend as well to say the gift of it is that it gives us so many different ways in so that we can ask ourselves then what is it that is my gift? What, it, what am I um, truly able to bring and, and to know that there is a place for you then in the work of peace building that there, because there are so many different ways in whatever unique gift that you have, unique service, talent, skill you have, there's a place for it. Um, and so I, I hope that we can continue that work also in the way that we, we teach theology and talk about Jesus. Anybody else have a question? I know we have a few minutes left. I appreciate that one. Uh, if not, I think I'll just do a little recap for everyone. So Common Read is a joint effort of MCUSA and MC Canada. Um, and as a part of that, <clears throat> encouraging churches to read a particular book together at the same time. Um, obviously, I Am Not Your Enemy is the selection for this window, which extends from January through March. Um, so we'll be posting about the book on social media. If you and your congregation, or if you have like a book club or a small group that's reading it together, we'd love to hear from you. If you wanna tag us on social media, we'd love to see um, your thoughts and your learnings from the book. Um, the next book uh, in the Common Read program will be Raising Disciples by Natalie Frisk, um, which came out uh, last year, actually around the same time that Michael's book came out. Um, and there is a, a downloadable study guide for that available on the Herald Press website as well. Um, if you have any uh, questions or uh, further sort of ideas about the program, please feel free to share those with us as well um, and follow Michael on social media uh, in addition to 
uh, Menno Media and Herald Press, his handle is uh, Michael T. McRae, um, spelled just like it is right here. Um, Michael's also willing to uh, join your small group discussion. So if you're having um, Zoom gatherings with a small group or a, a book study or a church group, um, please feel free to reach out either to Menno Media or his website is michaelmccray.com. You can contact him directly there. Um, he's already done a couple of those and had a really good time uh, chatting with with folks in the Common Read program. Um, uh, additionally, if you haven't purchased your books yet um, on menomedia.org for United States customers, um, there's a 30% discount on orders of four copies or more um, and comparable discounts are available for Canadian customers at uh, commonword.ca. Um, <clears throat> you can order through them. So we thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to share this session, the recording will be posted probably next week um, on the Menno Media and Herald Press um, social media accounts, uh, as well as on the Menno Media YouTube channel. Um, so thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the book um, and we can't wait to uh, see your, your learnings and your posts about it online. So have a great day, everyone. Here, everybody. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Take care.